Uh, welcome everybody uh, to our second episode of Mind Matter podcast. With me here is Virat. He's a student of uh, business at University of New York in Prague. And uh, I'm Naveen. I study psychology here at University of New York in Prague. And today we'll be talking about how subversion uh, is used in uh, a political context to change what people's opinions are about um, certain dictatorships or, or certain political stances and, and how certain governments basically um, enforce this on, on other people. And let's start with this, Virat. Uh, the oldest text of how um, uh, control can be influenced on a population goes by Sun Tzu. Am I pronouncing that right? Well, the thing with Sun Tzu is that his uh, text really covers warfare. But the thing is that warfare, in its nature, is just an extension of state policy. Mm -hmm. You want to achieve something as a state, mm -hmm. you either achieve it peacefully or through war. So what Sun Tzu explains is that basically all state policy should be directed in a warlike manner. In a sense, you're always thinking about achieving your goal, achieving your victory. Mm -hmm. And whether that's done peace peacefully or through violent means is irrelevant, it's still sort of a conflict. But he does say this, that, that uh, a war without, any, without even one person dying is the best, best war possible. Exactly. Politics is just another form of war. Mm -hmm. It's the war where nobody dies. Mm -hmm. And so it's the most elegant, according to Sun Tzu. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a direct quote from it, uh, in war, the way is to avoid what is strong and to strike at what is weak. And what is your opinion on that? Well, well, it's, it, this is the basic principle of, of strategy. Which yeah, is so you think like this entire book was about uh, the basic principles of what warfare is and, and how uh, it can be enforced on like, a, a bigger population? Well, no, it's, it's just basic principles in that you, you always play to your strengths and you attack your enemy's weakness mm -hmm. because everybody has a weak point and that's always where you should strike. Mm -hmm. But really what he is... Uh, sort of trying to express is, um, is, how do you say this? Are you talking about strengths and weaknesses or like are you diverting the topic? No, I'm trying to say that the reason why um, Sun Tzu is important is because he, well, basically all of war is deception. Mm -hmm. Because it's about, you know, it's about achieving your goals. It's not directly about, you know, the physical conflict, about mm -hmm. the... It's about achieving the goals you set out as a state. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. It's not about achieving um, like your military conquest or something like this. What, what is it about, you were going to say? Well, achieving your political goals. Really. Oh, okay, okay. So, yeah, that's all. Yeah, so that's it's an extension of, of, the, of the policy of the mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. But because, so there's a need for deception in this case, because it's about tricking your enemy into playing your game. Mm -hmm. Because if he's playing your game, there's no way you can lose. If you choose the spot of the battlefield, if you choose how they fight, if you choose the circumstances, you cannot lose. And all that is based on, of course, intelligence. So really, he's the one who pushed forward the idea that you need spies, you need uh, to always know where your enemy is, you need to know everything about yourself, mm -hmm. uh, you need to be the most well-informed person, and that's what brings victory, mm -hmm. because that's what allows you to make these decisions. So it's not, it's not just brutal strength, it's also, it's mostly, he basically shifted from this brutal strength to like intelligence, basically. Well, warfare has always been conducted this way, but he put it down yeah, in this sort of... Think. Well, those who won always conducted it this way. Right. But uh, he set it out in, a, in sort of a clear uh, mm -hmm. set of principles. Now, the, the thing is, is that most people, you know, just think this is espionage. This is just the collecting of information. And uh, the reason why uh, we bring up in the, in the talk later Yuri Bezmenov is because it's not just espionage. It's not just the information you can get of, the, of your opponent or of your, your target. It's also about how you can influence the information they already have. And so this is why, you know, today we're talking about subversion, which is, you know, this other part of, of, of information warfare, really, which is not only stealing information and finding out where the enemy is trying to deceive you, mm -hmm. but deceiving the enemy yourself by propagating false information. Yeah, and uh, USSR was, is, will be our main 
point of talking. Today. Oh yeah, because of the of the lecture. The lecture specifically references the USSR and is based on USS, um, sort of Soviet methodology and uh, um, doctrine of, of revolution. So. And so yeah, this person is a KGB. Was an ex KGB agent. Who well, well, you yeah. best know. Yeah, he well that's his real name. His uh, the the pseudonym under which he went for a long time was Thomas Schumann, mm -hmm. and um, he was a journalist, and uh, but he was also a KGB agent, and his goal was to produce propaganda for the the Soviet machine. So in the video, he he describes about how most of uh, the KGB budget. He, I, I, if I remember correctly, he says about 85% of it mm -hmm. is not directed toward direct espionage. It's not the, you know, as he says himself, blowing up bridges. It's not the stealing of supersonic, pla supersonic plane uh, plans and this sort of stuff. It's ideological subversion. And uh, this blowing up, up of bridges and things like this, they're, they're very emotionally connected, right? They have very emotional connotation to how what a civilization is and what it stands for. And... Like that's what he was talking about, wasn't he? Well, he he, he blames it on Hollywood movies. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's more that as, as human beings we have um, we feel far more impacted by violent actions, and it's it's a lot more romantic. You know, it is this idea of you know it, it reminds people of the Second World War and the resistance and mm -hmm. this sort of maneuvers. Yeah, speaking of the Second World War, immediately after the Second World War, the U.S.'s stance uh, to Russia like changed almost overnight. Do you think? No, like it was never, it was, it was always a marriage of convenience. Okay, so then at least uh, Yuri Bezmenov mentions this, that the, the political uh, opinion that Russia about, had about the US, basically as, a, as a, like a fellow partner who destroyed the Nazi Germany, mm -hmm. I mean Nazi uh, regime, uh, overnight turned into the aggregator against themselves. At least this is how Yuri mentions it. Mm. Well, that's because, like in Soviet propaganda, you know, like who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, switches every two years. Oh. Uh, in um, um, George Orwell, in his book 1984, makes fun of this, mm -hmm. where, uh, where there's a big parade uh, celebrating war with a country, and then suddenly yeah, all the posters change, and this, they're at war with a different country, and everybody just accepts it. Yeah. Like this is actually inspired by the the, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Mm -hmm. Where after this pact between the, the Nazis at the and the Soviets at the beginning Which of the year war, was this? this is in uh, forty one. No, forty one is, is when they break the pact. So this is in thirty nine. Okay, but um, or forty. Oh, I'm mixing up all my dates. I'm sorry. Don't the, mind. The um, so basically that during this period of peace, you have a lot of propaganda of like, oh, you know, the the Nazis are a socialist friend that uh, you know going to help us fight. Uh, against the capitalist uh, Jewish monster and you know, all this all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as the pact is broken, it's like, oh, the Nazi snake has turned on us and they are the abomination of all this. And so it's just, it's, it's just, you know, whatever is politically convenient, and then the propaganda backs up what's politically convenient. Mm -hmm. It was never an ideological mm -hmm. fight. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I just want to pull this, uh, this chart up that Yuri was explaining. Uh, Andre, our, our expert in uh, Technology will, ha will help us put it up there. Well, I think before. Maybe uh, no, no, but I think like to give some context to this is the the idea of subversion mm -hmm. is uh, basically um, you know, the reason why we bring up Sun Tzu is the idea of fighting, well, winning without fighting at all. Mm -hmm. And so, how do you win without fighting? Is you convince your enemy you're his friend, and you do that through subversion, subversion of his of his values as a of the values of the society. So the model that's given here is a model that Yuri gives for a uh, basically the this, the subversion which is um, which is used in order to convert a capitalist or nearly capitalist nation into a Marxist communist, mm -hmm. well not communist Marxist socialist nation. Okay. And, and he he describes this as like you being used by KGB uh, to influence different cultures and mm -hmm. things like this, right? Well, this is the first of the four stages of subversion. Mm -hmm. The first one being demoralization, the second one being destabilization, the third one being crisis, and the fourth one being normalization. normalization. Yeah. So this is the first step. This is how you demoralize the population, by attacking its values. So here, for example, the example he gives here is, um, is the whole uh, turning against uh, sort of, you know, the, the turning against what we call U.S. imperialism in the 1970s. And so 
uh, uh, this uh, Mr. Bezmenov here uh, thinks that this is all a product of uh, of Soviet-backed propaganda, either through uh, journalists that have been paid by the Kremlin, mm -hmm. uh, academics, students, really any actors, public figures, athletes, really anybody who has any any presence in public. So yeah. And so here, this is this is really the example that uh, applies to the U.S. I think mm -hmm. is the um, so on one side you have the subverted, which is the U USSR, mm -hmm. and then the target nation. Yeah, which is the U.S. in this case. Well, this it doesn't case. have to be. The, the thing is that it's not really. Mm -hmm. the, it's 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 the U.S. in the long term, but in the short term, this is not the U.S. It could be any other country. It could be population. any country population that they're trying to subvert, mm -hmm. and so. First, which, which was most of the countries, right, in the world, like at least that well, was their plan. Yeah, like to start a worldwide revolution and mm -hmm. to turn the whole world red. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And so first, you see sort of a growth of, of 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 Soviet military or of Soviet military intervention or help, and on the other side, you see sort of very pacifistic doctrine being pushed. You see, oh, you know, war is bad. We should, you know, we shouldn't fight wars. We should, you know, love each other. You know, we should, you know give an olive branch, you know, go across the aisle. And so and this happens at the same time as the Soviet camp is escalating their military mm -hmm. project. So it's just a very like deceptive thing then. Exactly. Yeah, so. This is the first step. The second step is you provoke actually the conflicts. So North Vietnam, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. whatever. And you and you push a lot of propaganda which you know this is a war of liberation. This is, you know, the people's war. This is a war of yeah. I think if you if you actually link this concept to like people's personal liberation or something like this, mm -hmm. I think the movement will obviously get much stronger then. Exactly. Because it, it can actually be put into any strata of society mm -hmm. at that point because it's very generalized. You know, it's personal and it's generalized for anybody. Exactly. Then there is the well, of course, but the whole point it, it has to work in tandem with you're supposed to get a simultaneous reaction in the U.S. and in the target nation. So in the U.S. you're supposed to get this, oh, we shouldn't intervene, or maybe, you know, sort of like a half measure, you know, like maybe we'll just, of course, this is far later, maybe we'll just throw a few drones there and maybe it will do something, even though it won't do anything. Sort of like, you know, half in, half out type measures where they, they know that they should intervene, but they don't want to because of all this propaganda pacifism that has been pushed. Mm -hmm. Then later, now this is, you know, very much in the time, this is in the, in the early 80s that he's making this lecture, which is the, you know, uh, draft mm -hmm. dodgers and this sort of stuff. 82, I think? 81, 82, something like this? I, I don't remember the exact date of the speech. And so, I mean, we've linked the speech in the description mm -hmm. if, uh, if anybody wants to watch it. Uh, feel free to get it. Oh yeah, please, please watch it. It's fantastic. It will, it will really give you some good it's, insight. It's very controversial on many points, but yeah, I think, it, I think it'll give a fair viewpoint mm. for, the, for the viewers. Well, the, but the whole point of this is this ends with on one side you have a the beginning of uh, basically the popularization, the popularization of uh, Marxist ideology in the host in the in the target nation, mm -hmm. and a decline in trust in the U.S. That's the sort of where you want to get. You want to get and uh, at a point where well, then there's another stage which is explained elsewhere, which is the the breaking down of society. But we'll go back to that later. And um, you you distance the country from the U.S. so that the U.S. also loses, you know, the, the want to go and intervene, but it also cuts its ties, you know, it, it, it removes a lot of the U.S.'s soft power as well. And so you have this sort of like this okay. perfect storm. Speaking of which, mm -hmm. what do you think about that? Sorry to take you off on this. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Um, how, what do you think is like the, the recent um, soft power change of, of the U.S. in the world? Do you think it's going up or down? That's one I, re I really I really don't know where to cut the line. I, I, I would say go down, uh -huh. but that's just a, a sort of a conservative approach. I wouldn't want to uh, overexert myself. But it's a very very interesting time. It um, Trump has not helped uh, the U.S.'s reputation, uh, but that I think is is because a lot of the of the media is. You think so? Yeah, I do think so. Well, that, that's, the, that's the question, you know, it's like how much of what you think is what the media portrays. Okay, let's, let's come back to our point then. Exactly. Yeah, all right. And uh, so we were talking about how, like, um, expansionism works in the subwater country and they basically diminish the 
uh, the military power of, of the target nation. Well, not just diminishing the military power, but the mili diminish mm -hmm. the military spirit. Because why, why, why? I mean, how could they? How could they do that? Just diminish the military spirit. In the sense of that, people hate soldiers. You, 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 you create this environment where people, you know, think, oh, you know, they see a soldier, they call him a murderer. You create this environment where there is this withdrawal. Nobody would volunteer. You create this environment where, uh, I don't know, the, you, you reduce spending on the armed forces. It becomes a voting point to reduce spending on the armed forces. It becomes a... Exa exactly. But none of this was actually happening during, like, uh, the Cold War era, right? Because both both Soviet Union and the US were only increasing spending. Yeah, no, actually, yeah. actually, no, towards the end, the US uh, decreased spending by a lot. Oh, okay. So you think that was an effect of Basically, if you look, this is just the spending on nukes. Mm -hmm. You see the US basically um, goes up. Sp they spend more in total than the Soviets on nukes, but that's because they were capable of doing mm -hmm. so. Not because they didn't, not because the Soviets didn't try. Mm -hmm. So you see this... <laughs> Look at that. You see this. Uh, you see this spike in the in the seventies, uh -huh. really in the in the in the amount of uh, money spent on, on nuclear weapons. Uh -huh. While in the Soviet Union, you see this very very slow increase all the way up into the nineties. So the U.S. basically after the seventies, and you see sort of like this more warmer form of Cold War, where you see this you know, these connections starting to form, and you don't have the same paranoia as before. The U.S. just calms down. Mm -hmm. the they they ramp they ramp down the production, and they outmatch. USSR in every aspect, even with ramping down the production, there's still a two, three times capacity mm -hmm. of what the USSR is producing. I mean, that's also because of what the economic capacity of USSR is. No, exactly. It's, it's all just branding, you know. I mm. think it was mostly just uh, the external front of it, which was given this golden ribbon, mm -hmm. and inside it was. Well, what I'm saying is that like like this, 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 you know, this sort of these ideas of uh, of pacifism worked. Mm -hmm. People reduced military spending. People wanted to stop. The people said, let's stop with war, let's stop with this overt aggression, let's stop with this US imperialism all over the world. And, this, and it did work, except that the USSR couldn't maintain itself. If they had survived, they would have been successful. About that, um, a lot of um, Arab countries nowadays mm -hmm. are coming to the opinion that US is incre increasingly imperialist. And do you think that is also part of this propaganda somehow? I'm just trying. Pardon my French, but I think that you know most Arab countries have a victim complex, and everybody is trying to imperialize them from their point of view. Okay. So it's you know it's like oh you know it's something we don't like, it's something you know foreign, it's uh, you know it doesn't have a veil on it, you know it's trying to imperialize us. Mm -hmm. So. Interesting. Interesting. But of course, it's it's a generalization. It's a bit it's a, it's a bit of a, an extreme way of putting it. But <laughs> if you if you want to simplify it to the max, I would put it that way. All right. All right. And uh, so these liberated areas and like how, how liberating them in the supporter uh, in, in the target nation basically for example I'll, I'll give you an example mm -hmm. I'm from the state in India mm -hmm. called Kerala mm -hmm. and uh, it's the south like the southernmost one of the southernmost uh, states in India it's very small it has a huge population and we have quite less land mm. and uh, the first time any communist government came into power who, who were the um, were the um, colonial masters there? The British. The British. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, like the the king. Th there were princely states there mm -hmm. who paid taxes to the British, and so okay. everything was kept in control by the British. But after the British left, uh, after fifties, there was a whole struggle until nineteen fifty seven, when the first time in the world when uh, communist government was democratically elected into power. Mm -hmm. Nineteen fifty seven. Mm -hmm. It was in Kerala. So um, after which. Uh, Kerala's uh, social indices went quite high. Yeah. But what people don't actually realize is, to start with, the social indices in Kerala were already high after independence. Mm -hmm. For example, I have statistics here from, uh, from the Indian census back in 1951, which said that 47.18% of Keralaites were literate back in 1951. Mm -hmm. That's a high number when you compare even Russia and like Eastern Europe. What were the numbers approximately in India back then? Like? Back then, I think about eighteen percent was the was the literacy rate mm -hmm. overall, and so uncomparable, you know. Mm. Like so, so basically, you're comparing this. We're talking about like a more urban population, right? No, actually, no. Oh, it's okay. very spread that's, out. that's surprising. Exactly, it's a very spread out mm -hmm. uh, population, and never 
urbanized that much. So why do you think like they're quite educated for a, for a rural population? Where do you think that comes from? I think the, the, the state was already rich, like richer than the rest of India in a lot of ways because of trade. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why everybody was already much higher in standards than the rest of India. The thing is today is, uh, today people over exaggerate this and say, like give credit uh, attribution to uh, the Communist Party of, of India, which is right now ruling in, in Kerala. In my state. But like, <coughs> how socialist is their system really? Uh, quite socialist. There are trade unions, uh, which we'll talk about in a bit, and trade unions have a lot of power. They keep the prices to up to what extent like they want. So they have ceilings and, and yes. floors yes. for prices? Actually, trade unions just set one price for everybody. And nobody mm -hmm. can nobody can exceed that price. Nobody can go below that price. So, so think about it. Mm -hmm. If you actually like find out a way to to make a product cheaper, you still can't make it cheaper in the market because of these trade unions. So mm -hmm. actually, there's no mobility in the market. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, and we were talking about so communism uh, given a lot of credit in Kerala, and. Today it is seen as the last front against right-wing right -wing nationalism in mm -hmm. India. Um, so I actually don't agree with, with how communism works in Kerala. I think it drives out a lot of people from Kerala into the Middle East, for example. Who, whoever want uh, good capital, they basically relocate to the Middle East. My parents are actually good examples of this. So they go to Oman, Yemen, yes. Saudi Arabia? Yemen, not so much. No? <laughs> no. Well, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so Oman, Saudi Arabia, all these oil-rich countries who yeah. are uh, very US-sided. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, they live their lives there, make all the money, come back and settle during their retirement age. Basically, all the taxes are uh, spent like uh, in, in the Middle East itself. None of the taxes go back in, into the Kerala government. So, um, I don't understand that. What do you mean, all taxes? I mean, see, the people who live in the Middle East, mm -hmm. the, the, employer, uh, the employees who work in the Middle East who are from Kerala, they don't pay taxes to the, the Kerala government, right? Oh, they don't? Because, no, they don't. Because all their spending is in, like most of their spending will be in those Middle Eastern countries. And of course, there will be like remunerations which are sent which will be taxed for mm -hmm. sure, but uh, not much, not much, not a significant amount and nothing that can be actually capitalized on by the Kerala government to actually make infrastructure and progress into, uh, you know, further fields. So, nothing significant in that yeah. No, just one thing I want to make clear. The, the point of, of the, of sort of the demoralization part of, of subversion is to, is softening the target for the, the next stages that come afterwards. So you're really, uh, you're making it ripe for 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 conquest. The other uh, part of of this demoralization, it's the it's the breakdown of social interactions within the society. So you take any uh, situation where you would normally have a, a social interaction, and you put in a bureaucratic arm of the government. So, you know, instead of parents agreeing, you know, when the kids will go where, you go to court. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, instead of agreeing between neighbors when you make noise, you call the cops. So it's always a, a quarrel or, or a fight. Basically. Exactly. You turn everything into a fight. You, you turn, turn everything into... into... So anything that can be actually, like, civil, uh, like, it, it can be resolved on a civil basis, it, it's always taken to it's ta well, it's, no, it's not. It, no, it's not taken doesn't have to be taken to court it's taken into the bureaucracy okay it's yeah. taken into the social workers you know office mm -hmm. it's taken into the fact that like we can't insult each other in the street anymore in most countries because you know they'll call someone will call the police and it's like oh you said something that was uh, discriminatory or uh, that's hate speech or something like this and you know that's it these are things that we spoke about last week uh, yeah. with mr Cohen. Mm. that's right so if you haven't seen that episode please yeah. go check it out yeah please the link would be in the description. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so really, it's the it's the idea that any so any social well social interactions can no longer be moderated by the individuals taking part in it. They need to be moderated by somebody else. Mm -hmm. And what you add like a, a bureaucratic institution in the middle of it, it's going to take care of it, and they'll decide for you. They'll tell you how so, you should. So people it. are not responsible for like what they do anymore. It, it's always taken somewhere else. Well, no, it's, it's not that people are not responsible for their own actions. It's that people are not responsible to each other anymore. Mm -hmm. It's that it's no longer all, you know, let's, let's, let's agree to agree. It's, you know, let's go find an arbiter to agree this. Mm -hmm. we, like, you see this in playground politics, 
Like instead of the kids, you know, fighting it out and sorting it out eventually, in, instead of killing each other, now it's you know the you know <laughs> f first flick <laughs> and it's you know run it's to a the barely wide image. Too, okay. Yeah. Well, and you know, the first flick or first, you know, pulling out of the tongue and you run to the, the teacher and tell her, oh, you know, he did this, he did this. Uh -huh. They come wag their finger at them and you don't learn how to, you know, deal with this situation. You solve a particular problem. You can't organize on, on a social level. Mm -hmm. sort of. And you break this down by destroying people's trust in every institution you have in society. So you destroy the trust they have in law and order. You know, you, you change, you know, you portray policemen, you know, as pigs, as, you know, the rude stupid, power abusive, uh, just add violent, wh whatever else you want to put, you know, and on the other side, you know, the criminal, you know, well, you know, he's been through some bad times, but, you know, he's a good guy in the end, and, you know, you, you, you change completely, like, you attack the values of the society, you flip them on their head, and people don't know what to think anymore, and, and, and because they don't know what to think anymore, they, they, how do you say, they lose trust in all the institutions. Mm -hmm. And they lose trust in the other individuals in the society. So this is basically creating room for some new ideology to come and like flood their minds. Well, it's creating room for chaos. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you, you see, for example, in, 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 co like, so in, in more colonial forms of, 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 of government, where every community is separate, there's always, you know, there's always like one spark and then there's a riot, you know, like in India, for example, there's... One uh, one guy gets beat up by uh, I don't know by some kids, and then suddenly you know all the neighborhoods, all the uncles, and all this stuff they go and they beat them up because it's it's religiously motivated now or something like this. So and it escalates and it turns into a riot, and then a bunch of people are killed. And so when you have this this fundamental mistrust between the, the individuals in the society and with the institutions. So what's going on is that the individuals don't trust each other. They can't organize themselves between each and other. And they don't trust all the institutions. They tr don't trust institutions, but they are separated from each other by the institutions. Uh -huh. So there's so a major divide which is created. Exactly. Between the people, the institutions, and, them se and each other. Mm -hmm. So it's isolation, basically. Complete they're trying to, isolation. They're trying to isolate you so that uh, they can inject whatever they, they want. Well, this is not injection. They just want to destroy everything. The point is, like, is that because the next step is destabilization where you just destabilize the system. And that's where you just throw the spark in. You throw a little something, could be anything, just, and you set everything on fire. You, 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 know, you activate your, 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 your hidden cells, your operatives, your, your journalists, your university professors, whatever else, and you create the stuff. It can be anything, you know? I think, I think in 50s, I have a good example for this, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, in the 50s, Kerala was experiencing, so, Traditionally, we had a lot of people and a, 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 like very less land, mm. right? And it's a very agrarian society. It was at least, not now, not anymore. It was a very agrarian society in Kerala. Yes, but I thought you had little land. Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. That's the problem, and there, there the problem rose. Okay. That there was so little land, and like this entire divide between people who had land and people who didn't have land. So like the divide sort of became like that, and mm. the people who didn't have land sort of went to the left-leaning side you know and and so similar to what's happening now in South Africa where it's like about redistribution of the land and this sort of yes, stuff. something like that I think, I think. yeah so uh, yeah we were talking about the next step oh and then you know there's the crisis moment where everything goes to hell mm -hmm. the entire system collapses and then you have normalization where either a you internal know, but from crisis it can go to either like civil war or it can go to uh, what was the other one Mm, to foreign invasion. Yes, invasion. Yeah. Well, that's the crisis, really. It's either there's a civil war in that there is a two groups within the country, one Marxist and one anything else. So exactly what we were talking about earlier in the land distribution thing. Yeah, exactly. Could be fascist, could be republican, could be could be anything. Mm -hmm. You know, could be uh, just any politically opposing yeah, ideology. Exactly. Okay. Uh, two, three, ten, whatever. You have the crisis period, and of course the Marxist uh, the Marxist uh, camp is being uh, is being funded by the USSR, and uh, once they have achieved victory, you normalize the the society. So this is so the two ways. So civil war, you have a, a party from the inside which is is Marxist and receives funding from uh, its Marxist supporters, and eventually wins over the country. The other option is foreign invasion from the USSR directly. <laughs> so like Afghanistan is a good example of this. Mm -hmm. It's you the society was completely destabilized mm -hmm. before before USSR came USSR shows up 
Well, and then you know the Americans, you know, use a similar thing with the playbook and say, okay, you know, let's let's destabilize it so much that even the they Russians, can't, even can't. the Russians can't maintain control of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then the normalization period is just you, you execute all the revolutionaries, obviously, because they, they're not trustworthy. They're a bunch of revolutionaries, and uh, you set you you set up the infrastructure, the bureaucracy, and you normalize. So you know. Yuri mentions this is the period of mass executions, the, the, the cleaning up house that happens usually. So, you know, if you want to look at the USSR itself, this is the moment where Stalin shoots uh, all, all of Lenin's old friends mm -hmm. and he just cleans house and uh, gets rid of all, the, of all the previous guys because they're revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. What they love is destroying governments and that's what they're good at. Mm -hmm. These people cannot be trusted. Yeah, it's not stable, right? Well, not just that, and also because, you know, these people are like, the, oh, you know, we will bring, you know, forward social justice and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. and, so, and once they see what social justice looks like, they realize it's awful and they, you know, they join the resistance. So you shoot them before they do that. Just to take you back on, on what we were talking about earlier, uh, you were saying that, uh, like, this ideology divides people, right? And uh, so this is basically the process of de-individuation and like people basically sense, I mean, lose a sense of their part of their community and like they so sort of lo lose a sense of self. Do you understand what I'm getting well, at? Well, um, explain that better. Explain the, this, the, the, the individuation. I'm not familiar with So that. basically when we, were, when we were talking about like uh, institutions uh, being divided and like people not being able to trust each other and like people being divided on, on a very individual basis. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is the process of the individu individuation, basically. People lose a sense of their belongingness to, to a group or their self itself, in, in a way. Uh, they lose a part of uh, what they what they sort of think is a part of their self, which is a part of their community, and so and therefore the group. So this the individuation process is what we were talking about earlier uh, when you said that the group sort of splits apart into smaller sections? Well, I think it goes in two directions. Well, one is you have, on one side, you have the, you know, the atomized individual, which is the people who are completely de-individuated from, from any group. And then you have the people who will just join a micro group. And this is, you know, where the whole identity politics comes in. Is, you know, you break people down by you know, class, gender, sexuality, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And they, they enter into their subgroups and it completely divides the, the, the greater whole. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that... And there are even subdivisions within these uh, within these groups, right? And the thing is that because you know, in a society, every you know, everybody's inter interdependent. These subgroups are not indiv individually functional. Exactly, exactly. Because it's society is exactly. as, as a whole, you know. In society as a whole functions as a whole. Yeah. And because so once you break them down into these smaller groups, who are not, you know, internally and in, you know, independently functional, you just pick them up. You just you know, pick them off one by one. Yeah. And after that, we were talking about the uh, the crisis phase. Mm -hmm. that? Or the normalization phase, sorry. Mm. That, that was what we were talking about. Yeah, well, the normalization phase is, you know, once, once the government is installed, it's like, okay, you know, stop this funny business, this revolutionary nonsense, get out. You know, like in North Korea, you know, they, they shoot all the people who made the communist revolution, and then, you know, the, 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 the Kims, you know, set up, they set up the whole mythology, they set up, and that's a normalization period, mm -hmm. where everything is normalized, mm -hmm. where everything is, you know, set back to stability and to, to normality. Well, nor normalization is a very cynical term mm -hmm. that they use, but mm -hmm. it's a very so it, it, it's it's you know the dark humor in the in the euphemism mm -hmm. that the, the, these sort of people like to use. And we were talking also about uh, so um, let me just bring this this figure into into this conversation. Edward Bernays, you know this, uh, this person. He was the he was called the head of like the father of public relations mm -hmm. and he sort of gave way to how uh, group psychology like works and I'm not familiar with him at all not right. so this person who was quite famous in, in the US uh, probably in the 60s mm -hmm. I'm not wrong um, and Chomsky has actually talked about this person a lot and he's written a uh, Noam Chomsky if everybody's not aware of this person yet um, so he was I think the nephew of Sigmund Freud mm -hmm. Um, and he was a group Chomsky. Chef. No, no, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> Edward Bernays, if, yeah, yeah. if I'm not wrong, that is. Mm -hmm. uh, and Woodrow Wilson actually uh, uh, basically to gather support to start the war, uh, he used uh, Edward Bernays' strategies to, to like, 
polarize the people to to start the war basically mm-hmm. do you understand what i mean i s- i understand exactly what you mean what are like what theoretically like what what's his um view? so basically like um from from you know that america was at the time filled with a lot of pacifists who who sort of did not want war from this entire process that we were talking about mm-hmm. earlier yeah and uh, he he basically wanted to gather support to start the war uh and i'm mistaken about 90 or 95% of the population were against it. Yeah, exactly. So that's why he needed to change their minds mm-hmm. so that he could get popular support for it. Mm-hmm. And um uh, this this was basically propaganda and US propaganda. Yeah. And he sort of formulated how how people uh should I mean how uh, this could be conveyed to people and how like certain marketing strategies could uh, sway people to one side to the side that like war should be started. In, from from the pacifist side. Mm-hmm. No, but like, what method does he use? Like, um, what's particular about like his new PR strategy? This this entire thing about group psychology wasn't it wasn't really there before. You oh, know? really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is quite new in the in the entire scenario that time mm-hmm. because uh, Sigmund Freud himself uh, was very revolutionary in the field of psychoanalysis, and later on, group psychology also was sort of derived from it almost. I think, um, and. Basically they they gave an aristocratic touch to democracy. They basically said the people don't know what's good for themselves. Like Woodrow Wilson's government mm-hmm. sort of thought this I think. Yeah, but this is like a progressive principle anyway. You think so? Well, that's the point is when people don't know what's good for them, we have to push them forward, you know. By the you know, we have to drag them out of the middle ages. By means of propaganda. You mean? No, not only because that's the only way you can do that. Any means of policy. Anything, anything. Anything you do to change public opinion mm-hmm. is automatically propaganda. No, but I mean you do that yeah, of course, but I mean you do that through policy. So organically if you don't like if the pol- like if the mindset of the people don't change organically, mm-hmm. then you you're putting propaganda into their heads. No, obviously, but you can change policy without changing their minds and don't just get used to and it. And how how are you so sure that this policy is I mean all these policies that these aristocratic uh, group will implement on the people are going to be definitely like good for the people? No, I don't think so, but I mean like that's like the whole idea of progressivism. It's like, you know, we're going to drag everybody out of the middle ages kicking and screaming. You know, it's like whether they want it or not, you know, we'll make them progress and we'll progress sh- well in what direction? And do they exactly, that's, that's what I say. Do they, they know if that direction is right, you know? That's my that's you know, that's my question. You know, I'm not defending them, but that's the whole idea, is, you know, we're we're dragging, you know, everybody, you know, together towards progress. And so the whole progressive ideal is, you know, they people don't know what's good for them, we need to tell them what's good for them. Mm-hmm. And uh, now we can actually have uh, Yuli Bezmenov's uh, video of, mm-hmm. of uh, Andre. If you can just bring that up, that'd be great. Clip from his video. It may or may not happen without the help of the Soviet Union, but the natural tendencies are being greatly taken advantage of and capitalized by the Soviet propaganda systems. How? Whenever trade union strikes, we have influx of propaganda, mass media, ideological dissemination. The workers' right, and we repeat it like parrots. Yes, workers' right. Who's right? Workers? No. The the only freedom of worker to sell his labor according to his own desire and will is taken away from him. By whom? by trade union boss unlimited power is given responsibility i want to sell my labor not for 250 an hour but for 2 dollars i don't have right my freedom is denied to me i know that if i sell my work for 200 for 2 dollars an hour not for 3 dollars an hour i will compete better with the, with the other guy who is lazy and more greedy So basically we were talking about basically we were talking about Yuri Bezmenov uh sorry Yuri Bezmenov yes <laughs> Yuri Bezmenov uh having this conversation with uh, some some uh journalist if I'm not wrong the the in the, in the video and um uh, he was basically talking about how uh, the US sort of tries to propagate its um 
its ideas into other countries. Well, yeah, but well, it tries to basically destroy the country by propagating it, well, propagandizing it, and uh, it breaks everything apart because you destroy the values of the, of the country, and then you transition into... But the thing is that, it, ironically, this fits you know, very nicely into Marxist theory, you know, sort of the idea that first you have feudalism, then you get capitalism, mm -hmm. then you get socialism, mm -hmm. then you get communism, you know, and so the communism is the, is the final perfect end The idea. Exactly. So sort of like, I guess, you know, this is, you know, sort of like, how do you get from capitalism to socialism system? Mm -hmm. the, uh, for, for those out there who don't know the distinction between socialism and communism, in, in Marx theory, uh, communism is the, f the end goal. It's the state where all means of production are owned commonly. So it's not really an achievable goal, at least not in the realistic world. At least it hasn't happened so far. Well, it hasn't happened so far. I don't know about how realistic it is. So it was all different forms of socialism that we've had so far, basically. Exactly. So every, you know, what we call communist governments are socialist governments. Mm -hmm. They're moving, you know, so they're moving towards communism, but they're not there. And I don't think it's possible to get there because... Uh, and anyway, even in theory, um, it, it is a socialist government. You know, I mean, even, even they call it socialism. You know, my, my mother grew up in the, in the USSR and she's, you know, in, in old socialist times, you know, she doesn't say communist. It's, it's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. to her. But um, the, um, how do you say, the socialism is, sort of, is, the central, is the system of centralized government that will spread out the means of production in order to reach communism. So socialism is the state control needed to distribute the means of production. Mm -hmm. And then once, that, once that's achieved, the government disbands, ideally, and you reach this anarchist state where everything is commonly owned. Yeah. And, uh, for example, uh, another example of like propaganda is, have you heard of uh, Voice of America? No, what is that? Uh, so it's it was uh, an international. It still exists actually. Mm -hmm. It was an international. Uh, it it's an international news agency, mm -hmm. which is by the United States government. Oh, so it's like the where it's where is it based? Uh, I think in the U.S. itself. If I'm not wrong. But no, but where do they where do they spread website their on the on, on, on yeah? But website. what's the target audience? All throughout the world, just influencing people. Oh, okay. So it's like it's it's like the international version of Radio Fury Europe. It's sort of like their, their counter version of, of what like Soviet propaganda was, you know? Yeah, so it's the international version of Radio Free Europe. I guess, yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, we, I also want to talk about how the internet works in Cuba and how people get their, uh, their whatever, whatever has to come from the US, how do they bring it into Cuba? Do you know about this? I have no idea about this. All right, so yeah, tell me about So this. basically, um, they, they bring in uh, uh, files in, in pen drives and hard drives into, into Cuba and mm -hmm. uh, store it on bigger hard drives and they use it as an intranet basically. There's no connection to the internet, like the internet and so they use it as an internet and so for example if you go to um, places where you can ac have access to all these files, internet cafes as they're called, they, they will have a huge database of, uh, of you know, different things that actually came from the U.S. and uh, a lot of files, basically. So it's very different how it works. In terms yeah, of that's cool. Well, I guess I guess the server is internal instead of being you know somewhere in the in, in a secure building or something. It's inside the cafe. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of propaganda, um, Putin. Um, he don't you think he's aligning a lot with? Uh, the the Russian Orthodox Church and, and like trying to take control over the Russian population by means of the Russian Orthodox Church. Yeah, but that's something you know. If you want to, if you want to, you know, see, be well seen by by. Well, I, I, the thing is, I don't know today. The thing is, today I don't know because you know I meet a lot of young Russians today and they seem very different from what you know Russians are historically. Mm -hmm. So I I don't want to you know put something. I don't know how to take over Russia today, but historically. The way you do it is you make friends with the church. I mean, that's how the Tsar did it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how Stalin did I it. I actually think, like Russia is coming more towards the Tsarist star uh, like side of things. You know, because uh, the patriarch, the current patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, actually said, "What is his name? Kirill? Yeah, Kirill. Mm -hmm. uh, he's actually, I think, quite good friends with Putin. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they're very interconnected and things like that. He actually politicized terrorism in Syria, and he called 
the fight with terrorism uh, is a holy battle so like he actually like gave a call of uh, i mean the, the exact opposite of what's happening in the muslim world uh, the the call for uh, jihad mm-hmm. against uh, the external forces he's basically doing it in russia yeah well he's he's, he's calling it by the same name they do exactly but i mean whatever he's he's the head of a religious institution you know No, you know, again, pardon my French, but you know, unlike our current pope, at least he has this set, a set of balls, you know. All right. So no, because I mean, like the current pope, you know, who's like, oh, you know, the poor and all this. Oh my God. No, I no, no, but I mean, the stuff, man. No, right. Yeah, no, but I mean, the current pope is, you know, just, you know, what, whichever is the most easy opinion, he'll just go for it. You think so? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. No, really. At least you know, Ratzinger was a, a real piece of work. Mm-hmm. who he was covering for pedophiles and all this stuff and I, I don't know why he's not in prison somewhere but at least you know he had you know the the, the strength of his convictions and if he believed something he would say so and he'll say no this is not acceptable the uh, pope francis seems to be just just, just whatever swaying like yeah exactly it's like, convenient yeah yeah all you know refugees are good yeah refugees are good all oh, trump is bad all oh, trump is bad uh, you know like just swinging with whatever opinion is easy and it's just pathetic At least you know this guy Kirill has the strength of his convictions. Yes, no yes. matter how much I disagree with him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, did you actually know about the, uh, the recent uh, uh, like the UK is against Russia? Do you know this entire thing that happened? Two people died in uh, in UK. Can you explain that? I have I, I really don't know the details. Like I don't just uh, have a general like uh, from what I understand is uh, an ex Russian agent was I think two of them were killed in U- UK if I'm not wrong on that from n- so some nerve agent or something no, yeah by the means of no, uh, n- mm-hmm. a nerve agent and they were actually not able to detect it for a, for a couple of days if I'm not wrong well really there's two options either you know the Russians really did it or somebody's trying to frame the Russians so that's the two options but I, I actually think this should like this could be the Russians mostly I have yeah. no clue. I have absolutely no idea and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to investigate. I'm not going to, you know, you know, cut and say, you know, it's either this or that. I have no idea. Anyhow, Theresa May along with, uh, I think even Rex Tillerson have made statements about how Russia has overstepped their boundaries. And, and yeah, but they say that every time. It's like, you know, R- 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 Russia looks at them wrong. It's like, oh my God, they've overstepped this, their boundaries. This you know, looks uh, more serious than I've, anything I've seen in quite some time. Mm. Like, uh, NATO is sort of ganging up on, on Russia. A lot of the EU is basically... Is that the point of NATO? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, they're, good, they're fulfilling their purpose. It's like, oh no. They're I mean, doing exactly what they were designed for. <laughs> and then, you know, they're surprised, you know, when NATO's like, let's include Ukraine. And Russia's like, hell no. And then they're like, oh, but, you know, like, how dare you, you know, stop us from slowly creeping our way around your country? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like, for example, the whole thing with Iran. You know, it's, I think people really lack... empathy with Iran you know I don't like the Iranians I don't like the regime I don't like anything you don't like the Iranians in, in what sense no in the regime how can you not the like some people oh no, no the, people, <laughs> the people I love yeah, Farsi is, am- is an amazing language and the rationalism that came out of it amazing yeah yeah, yeah. no amazing. I mean like in the sense cultural that, aspects of Iranians in the same way we were using the Russians or the Americans during mm-hmm. our conversation which is uh, I mean the state and so but we have to understand why do they want nuclear weapons well let's look east China, Pakistan and India who have nuclear weapons and they're not exactly friends with Iran. We l- we look at India, India is I think on the friendlier side of things with Iran. Friendlier, but we know and then there's Pakistan who's just bonkers. Uh-huh. Then you then to the north, Russia, nuclear weapons. Uh-huh. To the west, Israel, <laughs> nuclear weapons. To the south, US submarines full of <laughs> nuclear weapons. Uh-huh. They're like no way they want nuclear weapons as well. Of course, but you know like So you have to no, but just think about this. Mm-hmm. Like why what is preventing a war from happening in North Korea? It's the new that they have. Of course. So of what, course. what is prevent what, what prevents war in general since uh, the Second World War? <laughs> right, yeah. Since you was got it, me there. <laughs> when when's the H bomb in 1947, 1949? Uh, eight, I think, if I'm not wrong. Something. Since that time there hasn't been any like major conflicts. There's only been proxy conflicts mm-hmm. because of man. Um, if for those who don't know, MAD is mutually assured destruction. That's the you know the doctrine that uh, if you um, if somebody if anybody attacks somebody else, you everybody gets nuked and everybody dies. Yeah, basically in the end scenario, nobody wins. Mm-hmm. There's there's no winner whatsoever in the mm-hmm. scenario. Exactly. Um, and once this win- winner is eliminated, which is I think currently the goal of uh, Iran, of course, obviously since they're as you mentioned c- surrounded by nuclear states. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Why wouldn't they want nukes? That's what I'm saying. They want nukes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, 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 whether we should give it to them is a completely different question. Yeah, and I, I really don't think, anybody, think so. I don't think anybody's going to give it to them. No, but you see, you know, <laughs> that, that hasn't happened in history. Well, Obama... Uh, uh, do you think? Uh, what do you mean? Basically, oh, we'll stop, we'll, you know, we'll turn our backs and you guys can do your research. That's a different thing. Like handing them, like handing a country nukes is like, I think, suicide yeah, for, for any nation I who agree. is nuclear armed, yes. So, and is there anything else that we missed to talk about? Oh, well, f- we still haven't really talked in depth about you, you, well, your friend Yuri here. Oh, go ahead. Like, um, really, like the, the, actually what's really interesting what he talks about this, the, the idea of subversion is that the reason why it works is because we allow it to work. Subversion so only works if you let it work. So, the but how do you detect it in the first place? How do you know that it's it's going to be there in the first place? Because most people who are mm-hmm. living their normal lives, they're not expecting some foreign government to have a, their their exactly. ludicrous plan to exactly. to but divert them into some kind of plan of theirs. And well, actually, you'd like be surprised. Them. You'd be surprised. Uh, like, the, but some, the common man wouldn't have this concept. In some in some places, people are aware. Interesting. And what what kind of places? Like have? in Russia. Oh, okay. For example, <laughs> okay. <let's> go there. <laughs> wow. No, basic, basic example. No, no. But the, the reason why Putin is p- pushing, the reason why Putin <laughs> is pushing religion so hard, uh-huh. it's because it's it's like it's, we mentioned earlier. Yeah, no? It's yeah. it's it's a defense against subversion, mm-hmm. because if people have faith and they and they believe in their values no matter what, you know, without thinking really about them, they just have their values and that's it. Yeah, Yuri actually talks about Yuri mm-hmm. actually talks about this. Now, how yeah, religion is a very important tool. To that's how he concludes the the whole lecture. He said, mm-hmm. that, you know, the strongest counter suit to subversion is like religion, mm-hmm. which is you know, it's not the best conclusion to come to. Which is you know, <laughs> like how do you survive? You know, <laughs> go, go mar- religion. Yeah, how do you survive mar- Marxist indoctrination? That's what religious <laughs> indoctrination. Fantastic. <laughs> but so it's one for, for one for the other. No? Yeah. But you know, but. Um, the the idea that if you believe in your values no matter what it's they're impossible to attack mm-hmm. like the example he gives are the japanese they're a slightly different example they couldn't be subverted for the longest until the americans opened their borders in the 1950s i mm-hmm. think 1860s 19th century sometime yeah. in 19th century yeah. um they were completely isolated and you could not subvert them because they were closed mm-hmm. you came to the border and said say please leave you know, you're not welcome here we do not want your goods, we do not want your knowledge, we do not want your culture, you just go away. And they cannot be subverted. The USSR could not be subverted because the borders are closed, the population is controlled, and the, the, and, uh, there's, um, and the media is controlled by, uh, through straight propaganda. To bring you back to that example of Japan, do you think yeah. something, um, yeah. do you think something uh, in, embedded within the culture is the reason why uh, they came to this conclusion that we don't need external inter- interference or, or external interference will be mostly related to war in some way or the other. Do you think, no, I th- I think, do you think it comes from the core of the culture or is it just leadership or is it just a few people well, in the case who, of Japan, the initiative and, and like solve the issue? In the case of Japan, it's specifically leadership. Mm-hmm. This is a decision taken by uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu in like, in like the 15th century mm-hmm. where he basically says, well, you know, foreigners bring uh, new things New things bring change, mm-hmm. change brings conflict, mm-hmm. conflict, conflict brings civil war. So in order to avoid civil war, I'll just completely close the country and freeze it in time. But this I don't completely agree with, because change, it's also what like, keeps you above the rest. So, so that you know. I, I agree, yeah. but that was basically his, his theory. Because the thing is that uh, this was, he came out of a, of a period of civil war which lasted over 100 years, mm-hmm. where Japan was ripped apart in different clans Tenants. and all this stuff. And the thing is that you had a lot of outside, like the Portuguese showed up and like guns were showing up everywhere but, yeah, suddenly. The, po- the Portuguese actually, showed up as well. The Portuguese were allowed to do trade in, in Nagasaki and one other That's city. after. Oh, okay. That's after. Before, they, before they just showed up and they would trade with whoever, you know, didn't, didn't shoot them on sight or, mm-hmm. or chop them up because they're bloody foreigners. Mm-hmm. But, uh, so foreigners were always seen as... Well, like, they were always seen as suspicious. Mm-hmm. Interesting. But I think that was... A, that was Op- almost opposite of the case of what was in India at the time because mm. India actually benefited greatly from trade, mm-hmm. international trade throughout the, the up, up until the 18th century yeah. and, and which is why like currently its culture is being very strongly subverted by communism well not India as a whole but Kerala, Kerala. Kerala I think. but not now actually it happened way way back mm-hmm. yeah in the, like I said in the 50, in 57 is when most of the and now it's been a steady decline do you think of commun- co- communism? Mm-hmm. No. Okay. no. Somehow, 
this type what of is communism like a, has sustained in Kerala. This, this is the magic of the communism that exists in it's Kerala. It's like old school, you know, like... Uh, the the communists, uh, the, the socialists there are, are religious. They call themselves the Communist Party of India. Mm-hmm. But the leaders, they go to temples, they go to churches. They they show the people that they're also part of their religious sentiments. Mm-hmm. And whatnot, yeah. Because, uh, I don't know, my, my state is, uh, I don't know, marketed as the as God's own country. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of people are very, very into yeah. religion. Yeah. So. Well, you see this with like with the Nazis, for example. With you, you so it's, it's completely weird. Well, what you were also we were talking about earlier. Yeah. I'm sorry to cut you off. Yeah, go ahead. What yeah. we were talking about earlier. See, like you, we were talking about that religion is uh, can can act as a way uh, so that communism do, does not permeate. Well, it's not. Co- well, it's not. Like and, it's and what if it exists, coexist together? And how do you how do you repair this? No. Well, the thing is, it's not. It's not like a cure all to communism because like mm-hmm. Christi- like. Uh, communism comes out of Christianity really as an ideology, sort of this you know, commonality. You know, even though you know communists will always deny it, you come out of Christianity, guys. <laughs> and uh, uh, okay, and um, so it's not that it's 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 um, religion he, he is is a shield against subversion, mm-hmm. any sort of subversion really. Which is you know this is why you know a lot of pl- places in the Middle East you know the culture doesn't change because the religion is is built against subversion. It's that's because subversion works by destroying the values of a place. You destroy the values, people don't know right from wrong, and they don't know anything anymore, and they feel completely lost, you know, they're adrift or whatever. And I'm not talking in the personal sense, but I mean in the, in the moral sense, you know, nobody can agree, you know, this is wrong, this is right, and everybody's, you know, arguing over So in the collective sense, everything is dispersed. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And the cure to that would be religion, because religion says this is how it is, and it's everybody organizing. has to believe it. Yeah, yeah it's exactly. organizing people into a, co- a, a collective opinion, almost, like... Mm-hmm. No, because you know that's the thing is that in a culture that can be subverted is an open society because you need to be open to foreign ideas for those foreign ideas to come in and subvert you. So is it a good thing at the end of the day to have well, a culture which can be subverted or a culture which? Well, can't I, be I think open societies are a good thing, but it's 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 definitely an inherent weakness of it. Mm-hmm. And um, but the I think the only thing that we can do is make people aware of, of these strategies, which a lot of um, organizations can use against them to mm-hmm. to. E, like tear them apart and and fix all these ideas into their heads. Do you mm-hmm. think just make them just making them aware that that this has happened in the past will will give them a raised awareness, a sense of awareness that what can happen in the future amongst people and what what are the ideologies that can be injected into a particular population. Do you think that can help? Well, it helps to a certain extent, but the the, the, the problem with this stuff is that it's it's really insidious. It's that pe- if you don't pay attention, you just won't notice it. Mm-hmm. And even if you're aware of it, if you don't pay attention, it will just slip right past you. Mm-hmm. And then you will turn around and everything has changed and there's nothing you can do anymore. Interesting. Interesting. And so th- that's what's really tricky about it, is that it's a strategy that capitalizes on every one of our sort of cognitive weaknesses and pushes them. And, you know, we can't, you know, we can't cover our backs constantly, so it seeps in. And, of course, you need, it needs to be pushed and pushed, you know, with, with a certain amount of determination. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's where all the, all, all, the, all the KGB funding comes, you know, goes, you know, it goes to get journalists, university professors, various academics, uh, different celebrities, singers, all this stuff. You know, like, uh, say, when you say, what's his name? Uh, when, when Russell Brand runs around, you know, going, <laughs> oh, yeah, communism is great and all this stuff. It's like, if you, if you had the 30 years ago, probably found it, found, funded by the USSR. Uh-huh. But now I think he's, he's self-funded now. Yeah, no, he's like he's just a celebrity. I think he's just running around saying what's on his mind. But mm-hmm. also, Andre, could you play the second clip, please? From Stalin to Khrushchev, from total tyranny and oppression to some kind of liberalization. Second. When I started working for the Soviet embassy in India, I, to my horror, I discovered that we are millions times more oppressive than any colonial or imperialist power in the history of mankind. That my country brings to India not freedom, progress, and, and friendship between the nations, but uh, racism, exploitation, and slavery. And, and, of course, economical inefficiency to this country. Since I fell in love with India, uh, I developed something which, by KGB standards, is an extremely dangerous thing. It's called split loyalty, 
when an agent likes a country of assignment more than his own country. I literally fell in love with this beautiful country. So yeah, what he talks about there is uh, how the as a KGB agent, um, the worst thing that could happen to him mm -hmm. was uh, this this split loyalty thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was absolutely the worst thing that can happen to a KGB agent who was an uh, an insider, and he basically looked at Indian culture and he said, "Wow, what a like, yeah, what, exactly. what, what an amazing. ancient yeah. what, what an ancient culture," and and he actually goes on to say that. While people were cavemen in, in Russia, mm -hmm. like where he came where he came from, India was a civilization like five thousand yeah. years back, and yeah, that's something that I want to talk about, like because think about it, this person he's so strongly uh, rooted in his KGB ideals, and mm -hmm. he comes as a, as a diplomat to India, and he gets changed. How do you think this this kind of change can happen to people once they're so strongly, uh, you know, put into a particular opinion? Oh well, I mean. It happens to everybody. There's always this one moment. You know, it's, you, you believe something until the moment you stop believing it. Mm -hmm. There's always this moment where you click and you say, oh shit. Like, <laughs> I was wrong. I was so, so, so wrong. Uh -huh. And uh, I think that's what happened to him simply. Yeah, I think he just made logical sense of like everything well, that's happened. Well, he, he fell in love with India. Mm -hmm. He fell in love with India and, you know, that sort of snapped him out of him because he realized that what he was doing was trying to destroy it. Mm -hmm. And he said, why am I doing this? And, so, and he defects. And he defects to Canada, if I'm not wrong. Well, he, def he, co he contacts the US, mm -hmm. and the US basically allow him, well, they say, okay, you can defect to us, mm -hmm. and we'll grant you asylum in Canada. It's, I think it's uh, was it Pierre Trudeau, the father of the current uh, prime minister, mm -hmm. uh, Justin Trudeau, who grants him the asylum in Canada in, like, was it the 80s? Uh, I think it's... 70s, if I'm not wrong. I'm oh yeah, don't don't count. 70, 70, 70, 70. early 70s, and then he gives these lectures in the early 80s. Sorry. And uh, you wanted to talk about uh, capitalism. Oh well, what's ironic is that you know, well, actually, this although this is a bit of a tangent, <laughs> <laughs> it's a stretch, a little bit. Yeah, a bit of a. Well, well, I find it, well, I just think it's ironic, really, that uh, although this is a personal opinion of mine, so like, don't take you know, take everything with a pinch of salt. <laughs> just you know, a little something you know to to make people think and uh, make them cogitate a little bit on this. Mind, mind the matter. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> mind the matter. Exactly. Um, so. In, in sort of in the in the evolution of societies that we see in Marxist theory, where we go from feudalism to capitalism to socialism to communism, this is the state of transition between capitalism and socialism. And what I find interesting is communism being the state where everything is all commonly owned, and uh, it's an a the anarchist state where everything is commonly owned. The best way to achieve it is not actually through socialism, but through capitalism, because Capitalism is sort of the, the machine that creates abundance because you optimize uh, both the value and the use of uh, the limited resources you have. Mm -hmm. so, and, and so what happens is that the, the, the resources just increase because you keep finding new ways, new sources, substitutes, everything, until the point where you have so many, well, you know, whether it takes a hundred years, a thousand years, a million years, Let's not put it that far, okay. Yeah, well, you know, it can, it can, you know who knows, you know, the, sure. <laughs> the, 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 the imagination is the limit. The decline is all that. Yeah. <laughs> you end up in a state with practically infinite abundance, mm -hmm. where everybody, and then, you know, when, when there is everything, there's no more point in owning anything. Because everything is, and, there's, and everything is commonly owned by everyone, including the means probably, of production. But this is probably not, like, it, it's not well, imaginable so, for, like, most people who... who live their normal lives. But the thing is, work. socialism does the complete opposite. Socialism impoverishes the population through mismanagement mm -hmm. and brings you back into a feudal system mm -hmm. where so you end up with the, the, you know, the politburo, you know, aristocrats and, uh, and, you know, the serfs, you know, doing the mandatory work for the fixed pay they don't get to, you know, negotiate. It's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a reversion back to it. Mm -hmm. Gee, well, Marx was wrong, guys. <laughs> <laughs> he was wrong in his theory in that you reach communism through capitalism and you, you skip the socialist part. Socialism is, you know, the way backwards. It, it impoverishes the population back to like a, a quasi-feudal state. Mm -hmm. So just a bit of which, food for thought. Which is sort of what happened in Canada. It's, 
if I if I have understood everything. So it's gone back to sort of like a landowner versus landless yes. dichotomy. Yes. Besides, uh, exactly. Yes, and uh, basically the union uh, heads hold the the feudal power, mm -hmm. and they control what what the union workers do and whether they they do a strike on that particular day. And by the way, if a strike happens, not even one person is actually allowed to open shop. The entire economy is shut when the communists want to strike. Mm -hmm. And most of the time it's the communists who want to strike. And uh, the entire economy goes to shut down. I, th I think this is completely unfair. You know, a, a normal person wants to live a normal life. How is a person who is poor, even according to communists, how is a person who is poor supposed to run his, that day's expenses if just by some kind of political means you want to alleviate his business for that particular day? How is it possible that he runs his family? He has to commit suicide. So this is like not a system that works, basically. And you know, like in the in the ancient Egyptians, if you didn't uh, if you didn't meet your quota of grain, you were punished for oath breaking. Oh God! Because <laughs> you promised to supply that grain. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't if you didn't fulfill it, you were, of course you know most of the time you just paid a fine because mm -hmm. you know they, 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 if the Egyptian government lost something, it was money. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, in the BC. Yeah. This is this is during Cleopatra's Egypt, so it's still BC, yeah, or even before. But like you know, it's the, the, the this notion of you know if if you don't do this, you know if you don't meet your target that we set and we set all the conditions and we set everything, all the situation, you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do this. Mm -hmm. We set a target. If you don't meet it, then you know, mm -hmm. get I lost. See. I see. I see. Anyways, on that note, it was a it was a great discussion that we had. Yeah. Thank I you. Had, I had a lot of fun. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. And uh, it, it, uh, next week, at the same time, we will be having a discussion. Uh, don't forget to join us at 5.15 on next Friday. Thank you for joining us. Have a nice evening. Uh, goodbye from the Man Matter team. Bye.